Well, thank you for inviting me today. I wish I could be there in person, but uh, we'll have to make do with uh, the Zoom, I guess. Uh, I was asked to say a few words today about probably the most famous Polish fire squadron of World War II, the uh, 303 Kosciuszko Squadron that fought with the RAF, the Royal Air Force, during most of the war. So let me start by just uh, giving a few words about how this squadron actually came to be in the first place. Following World War I, Marion Cooper, an American, uh, journeyed to Poland where he saw a lot of the devastation of the war and the relief efforts and so forth. And he was the grandson of a colonel of the American Revolution who had fought with General Pulaski at one point. So he conceived of the idea of starting a unit of American volunteers in Poland the same way American Volunteer Squadron had served in France during World War I. He put it together and Elliot Chess designed from Texas, designed the squadron logo, which had the Krakowian Rokatowska and the crossed sides of the Kosciuszko insurrection superimposed over the 13 red and white stripes and 13 stars of the original American flag. So that's where the uh, unit symbol comes from. They flew on Albatross uh, fighter planes from World War I. You can see here some of them lined up uh, on the runway with the Kosciuszko squadron symbol on the side of the plane. When the Bolsheviks invaded Poland, part of the attack came from the south toward the Wolf. And it was here that the Polish 6th Army was deployed, and along with them, the Kosciuszko squadron. And they fought against this southern pincer and were successfully able to drag it back so that it was unable to connect with the rest of the Russian forces that were eventually besieging Warsaw. Uh, General Antony Lostovsky wrote, the American pilots of the 7th Squadron are performing miracles. The Virtuti Militari is roughly the equivalent of the American uh, Medal of Honor given to people for extraordinary combat exploits. When the war was over, nine of the pilots in the Kosciuszko Squadron were awarded the Viterti Militari. So the squadron originally began as Americans with one or two Britons and a Canadian, uh, formed to fight for Poland at the end of World War I during the Bolshevik invasion. When World War II comes along, the squadron is still active, only by now, of course, it's been incorporated into the Polish Air Force, and now it's manned completely by Polish pilots and Polish ground crew. At the beginning of the war, you can see that Poland was greatly outnumbered in terms of aircraft. Uh, the Germans threw 1,500 aircraft into the invasion of Poland against only 397 uh, Polish aircrafts. To make matters worse, most of the Polish fighter planes that would be opposing the German invasion had been made three to seven years previously. And in the 1930s, aircraft engineering was expanding rapidly, so that was quite old. 90% of Germany's fighter aircraft were three years old or less, so they were much more modern and better equipped. The Kosciuszko Squadron in 1939 was numbered the 111th Squad Pursuit Squadron, and it was based outside of Warsaw for the defense of Warsaw. It shot down its first German plane on September 1st, the very first day of the war. And here you can see one of the Polish planes that were used, a PZL P-11. These were rather ironic aircraft because they were the first, first flown in 1931, and they were the first all-metal pursuit plane of any air force in the world. Uh, Jerzy Sink, the historian of the Polish Air Force, wrote that the Polish Fighter Force became the first in the world to be entirely armed with all-metal model planes. 
The problem was that the post budget was very short. They did not have enough money to continually upgrade the aircraft. So while they were able to sell the PZL to several neighboring countries, they were never really able, because of financial constraints, to update it. As a result, when the board breaks out, the average speed of the Polish fighter plane was 320 miles an hour, where the standard German Messerschmitt 109 was 359 miles an hour. And as you can see, the Messerschmitts outnumbered the uh, Polish pursuit planes and guns and the size of their armament as well. The Polish planes had a fixed undercarriage, meaning that the wheels would not retract, which cut down on speed and maneuverability. Only the squadron commanders had radios, where all of the German aircraft had radios. Communication had to be by hand signals from open cockpits. So they developed a tactic where they would try to get above the incoming German planes, dive down through them, and then turn away as quickly as possible to try and escape a German counterattack. Uh, obviously, they were at considerable disadvantage. There's a picture of them flying uh, over the Polish countryside. Initially, they had nine aircraft. They succeeded in shooting down eight German planes at the loss of only one of their own pilots who was missing and unaccounted for. Uh, this was before the Warsaw finally surrendered. The German Air Force admitted to the loss of 295 aircraft in Poland, and another 279 with serious damage that required repair before they, before they could fly again. We often hear about how the Polish Air Force was simply eliminated in the first two or three days, but actually the data shows that they shot down over 25% of the attacking German planes, which was certainly not bad considering that their planes were relatively antiquated by that time. With the fall of Poland, a lot of the Polish military personnel escaped either through the Middle East or to France and to Great Britain through different routes. Uh, the Germans, of course, knew this was happening, and they derisively refers to these refugees as Sikorsky's tourists. February 1940, the Polish government in exile in France signed an agreement to create Polish military units, including Polish Air Force units in France. These would wear Polish uniforms and have Polish military ranks and markings on their fuselage, but they would have French markings on the wing and the tail. And that, of course, was necessary so that they wouldn't be mistaken for Germans in the air. By April of 1940, there were over 8,000 Polish airmen, including ground crew members, in France and England, an enormous number uh, to have escaped from Poland after the fall of the country. Most of them were based a little bit north of Paris at three separate airfields. Uh, the French, however, didn't believe that the Poles were worth very much. Uh, the Poles were really annoyed because they spent most of the time in camp in idleness. They were not given new uniforms. They were not receiving any pay. Uh, and they had no new equipment for the most part. Of the roughly 1,000 Polish pilots who made it to France, only 145 were actually given the opportunity to fly uh, in the air operationally. On one occasion, 18 pilots were sent to a three-month training course. Now, I remind you, these are all pilots who had flown in Poland before. They were sent for three months of training. They finished it in one month and were eventually given French Moraine Saulnier fighters. These were old, lightly armed, and obsolete by this time. Poles were astounded at the lackadaisical French approach to the war. At a French base where they, the Poles were also assigned, at nighttime the French would simply go home uh, to sleep in their beds and have breakfast in the morning and come back around 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, most of the German air raids occurred early in the morning. So they were way too late to prevent any German air raids on their own aircrews. 
one of the Polish unit commanders wrote, we did not have any amicable relations with the French officers. They treated us as though we were enemy prisoners of war. They were re-outfitted with newer French fighters, but the French considered them, themselves considered these completely unusable in the air. Despite all these disadvantages, Polish pilots shot down 56 enemy planes. They were credited with another 10 probables and seven damage. Considering they formed less than 5% of the pilots who flew in France, this accounted for 16% of the losses suffered by the Luftwaffe. With the fall of France, most of the pilots escaped to England, with a few of them escaping to North Africa as well. Uh, here's an interesting picture of them aboard ships heading for Great Britain. And I love the guy in the middle who's playing the accordion to entertain everybody as they're escaping. In 1940, Winston Churchill made one of his most famous speeches in which he said uh, that General Wigan, what General Wigan had said that the whole, whole Battle of France was over, and I expected the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. And he went on at the end of his speech to one of his most famous quotes of the entire war, where he said, let us therefore embrace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last only a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. Two months later, not a month and a half later, Adolf Hitler issued an order to the German Air Force to overcome the British Air Force with all means at its disposal and as soon as possible. And the German, the serious German air raids and the Battle of Britain, as it was called, began on August 13th with Eagle Day. The German goal was to win air superiority, in other words, to suppress the Royal Air Force, and then to completely destroy it within four weeks. If you look at the scores for the major uh, times the Germans launched raids on Great Britain during August, you can see that on every day the RAF, the Royal Air Force, suffered fewer losses than the Germans. But the German Air Force was considerably larger than the Royal Air Force. And if you look at the last data for the first week in September, RAF losses were almost equal to German losses. They had reached by the end of August a point where losses were no longer sustainable. They needed more pilots, they needed them desperately because the RAF was being blood dry. Enter the Kosciuszko Squadron. It was formed in July of 1940 from the surviving pilots of the Warsaw Pursuit Brigade, originally with 21 pilots, both officers and NCOs, and 135 Polish ground crew. On August 2nd, it was sent to the Royal Air Force Base at Northolt, which was in the defense perimeter for the city of London. The pilots wore Royal Air Force dress uniforms, but with Polish Air Force insignia on the hat and on the chest. They also had Polish buttons and the Polish 303 Squadron emblem, and a Polish patch on the shoulder to denote them as pilots from Poland. Uh, this is a uh, picture of a uh, 303 Squadron fighter later in the war. Now uh, this is a Spitfire. Originally they were uh, outfitted with hurricanes. So this is a little later in the war. The Royal Air Force Round Book appeared on all planes to distinguish them from Germans. RF was the code symbol for the 303 Squadron, so that appeared on all of their planes. D meant that this was the fourth aircraft, so each aircraft went the RF followed by A, B, C, D, or whatever the individual plane designated was. It had the 303 Squadron symbol, 
On the front was the Polish Air Force checkerboard symbol. In this particular case, the pilot had a personal symbol that he had painted on the side of his uh, plane. And underneath the Kuchesma Squadron symbol were little uh, symbols for each German aircraft he had destroyed. A close-up of the cockpit shows his personal symbol, Donald Duck. Why, I'm not sure. The Kuchesma Squadron symbol, and underneath that, a stencil for each of the German aircraft that he destroyed. This is a page out of the Squadron Activity Book. And you can see here, training, 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 repeated instances of training day after day after day. The British didn't really trust the Polish pilots in the air. And actually for some very good reasons that I'll get to in a minute. At the end of August, the Air Chief Marshal, Hugh Dowdy, visited the squadron and gave them a pep talk and talked about the war and how it was going and what their part was going to be. And at the end, if they, he asked if there were any questions or any comments. And one of the flight leaders, Vitor Verovich, got up and said, disgustedly, we have not come all this way to sit around learning English. He was anxious to get into the real action. Marshal Downing once said, I must confess that I had been a little doubtful of the effects which their experience in their own country and in France might have had upon the Polish pilots. Now remember, these were pilots who, from a British standpoint, had lost in Poland, they had lost in France, here they were in Great Britain. You know, what could possibly be expected of these people? To ease the transition, the British assigned squadron leaders and flight leaders who spoke English uh, to work alongside of the Polish commanders. One of them was a Canadian named John Kent, and he wrote, all I know about the Polish Air Force was that it had lasted about three days against the Luftwaffe, and I have no reason to suppose they would shine any more brightly operating in England. Now, but there were some reasons. Poles were not used to retractable landing gear. As you saw, all of their planes in Poland had landing gear that couldn't retract. So there were two or three occasions where Polish pilots came in for a landing, forgot to put down their wheels, and ended up sliding across the runway. In Poland and in France, they never had radar or ground control intercepts, so they were not used to coordinating things with radar installations on the ground. In Poland and in France, if you wanted to open the throttle and increase your speed, you pulled out on a lever. In England, you had to push in. The airspeed on the British planes was in miles per hour, not kilometers, as they were in France and Poland. The altimeter was in free feet, not meters. And they were not used to closed cockpit canopies, so sometimes they forgot to open them or lock them. They were not used to radios, so sometimes they occasionally left the radio switch on, which jammed the frequencies and no one could talk with each other. And even the parachute, if you had if you were hit and had to bail out, and you grabbed for where your parachute was in Poland or France, the ripcord for the parachute was on the opposite side. Even regulations for making beds were different. So imagine today you go out and get in the parking lot, and instead of pushing your accelerator down, you have to pull it up. Especially as if you try to push down your brake, and instead of pushing down on it, you have to pull up. You're reading in, in uh, kilometers instead of miles, and you have to drive on the left-hand side of the road instead of the right. This is essentially what Polish pilots were faced before they could go into combat in England. And in combat, a half a second, sometimes not to life, life or death. So they had to retrain every one of their reflexes in order to survive in the Battle of Britain. Now uh, we had to uh, reverse all of our instincts, Zornbach wrote. All this led to some interesting situations as one can imagine, wrote flight, uh, flight leader Kent. 
And the captain of the division they were assigned to wrote in 1940, both Polish organization and discipline leave much to be desired. And without extensive British control, uh, uh, it will be impossible to form efficient Polish air units. One of the things that drove the British crazy was that the Poles didn't fly in real tight formations. The British were used to flying with radios. They flew in very tight formations. And if the radio told them the Germans were off to the left, they all turned to the left to engage. Poles weren't used to heavy radios, so they flew, flew in very loose tornado formations with a lot of space between the planes because they were more interested looking around to see if there were any Germans nearby than spending all the time worrying if they were going to run into someone. So that drove the British crazy. On August 30th, they were out on another training mission when all of a sudden one of the Polish pilots spotted a German plane below them, actually a formation of German planes. Once he was alerted, the English squadron commander immediately ordered them back to base. Uh, pilot officer uh, Paskevich disobeyed orders, engaged the Germans, and shot down the first plane that 303 squadron was credited with. The next day, the squadron was reprimanded, but also made operation. They were assigned uh, hurricane fighters, which was the not quite the newest, the Spitfires were newer, but they were also outclassed by the standard German fighters. They were slower than the Messerschmitt 109 and the Messerschmitt 110, and they were also outgunned. Uh, the Germans had 20 millimeter cannons, the Hurricanes and the Spitfires both relied solely on machine guns. So the quantity, the quality rather, of the fighters, while it was good, was somewhat less than the German fighters they were going to be saying. In their first action, they shot down, they were credited with shooting down with six German aircraft, I'm sorry, four German aircraft, with two damage. Uh, and this was by six Polish aircraft. And they suffered no losses. The group commander wrote, group commander sends congratulations to number 303 squadron on their excellent fighting this afternoon when they destroyed four enemy aircraft without casualties to their own pilots or aircraft, which demonstrates good teamwork and straight shooting. The air minister wrote, I congratulate squadron 303 on its splendid day's fighting. September 7, 1940, an article appeared in the London Observer, and the author said the next seven days may decide the issue of the whole world. There never has been a more critical week in world history. The perils of any Nazi attempt to invade Britain are at once manifold, but it is now or never for them. They, if they flinch, we win. This is at the height of the fear of the German invasion of England. Uh, Hitler had ordered an invasion of England. The plans were set. They were just waiting for the German Air Force to gain air superiority over England. September 7th, Hermann Goering wrote, today is the historic hour when our Air Force, for the first time, delivered its blow right into the enemy's heart. On the same day, 303 Squadron had 14 confirmed kills and four probable. This was an RAF record for the number of German planes shot down by a single squadron in one day. Although they lost two planes themselves, both of the pilots bailed out and one of them suffered only slight injury. The entire rest of the Royal Air Force shot down 61 planes and a loss of 20 of their own pilots. So the Poles did really well in their first major encounter here. September 15th, Sergeant Karubin, out of ammunition, actually rammed his own plane into a German to bring it down. And surprisingly, he was able to bail out and reach land without suffering any major injuries. On September 15th, 303 Squadron had 15 confirmed kills 
and one private, losing two planes but only one pilot. This topped their own previous all-time record. This was an all-time record that was never surpassed by any squadron, British or any other Royal Air Force squadron during the entire rest of the war. The group craft really couldn't believe that they were actually doing this. So when the next alarm sounded and the squadron was scrambled and went up to meet German aircraft, he got into a plane and tagged along behind them to see what was really happening. In the scuffle that followed, he eventually landed and the first words out of his mouth as recorded by one of the officers who met him was, my God, they are doing it. He later wrote, the poles jumped into the scattered individuals and suddenly the air was full of burning aircraft, parachutes, and pieces of disintegrating wings. It was so rapid, it was staggering. So how did they do this? Well, you remember earlier I mentioned that in Poland, because their planes were slower, more vulnerable, had no radios, they developed a tactic of flying above German aircrafts and then zooming through the formations and getting out of the way as quickly as possible. Well, what they were doing in the Battle of Britain was kind of a modification of this tactic. They would send one flight, two planes, above the Germans and dive down through them and picking off a plane or two if they possibly could. But picture yourself as a German pilot. You're in your formation, you fly formations because that way the guns, the defensive guns of all the different aircraft can be brought to bear on any intruders. And you see these crazy pilots diving straight at you. Obviously you're going to turn away rather than let them ram you. So the German pilots break formation and once they've broken formation, they don't have as much defensive fight or singly as they would have if they were together. So the rest of the squadron then pounces on them and picks off the straight planes. And that accounts in large part for the enormous score that they were racking up. Here's a, a very famous picture that was published in any number of books after the war of the pilots of 303 Squadron returning from one of their successful intercepts of German aircraft. During the Battle of Britain, on the most important day, Polish pilots were credited, there were 109 Germans uh, shot down. 11% of that was shot down by Polish pilots. The largest, second largest number was 48. Polish, pilot, Polish lost five pilots killed, which was 70% below the average for the RAF in the same month. This is in September. Polish shot down 109 Germans. The next highest squadron was 48. And they did it while losing 70% fewer of their own pilots. The BBC on September 20th wrote, congratulations to the famous Polish squadron uh, about its magnificent record and all best wishes for its future. You use the air for your gallant exploits and we foretelling the world of them. Long live Poland. An ADM flight leader, Kent, wrote, the Poles were playing the games with keeps far more than we were. If you look at the total score for the Battle of Britain, Poles were credited with shooting down 126 Germans, probably another 13, which were believed to have been shot down but couldn't be confirmed, and damaging nine more. And here you see somebody has written on the side of one of the Polish planes the score for the Battle of Britain. If you look at the top squadrons during the Battle of Britain, the Poles were on top. The second highest was a British squadron, 102, 
Also noticed that most of the top scoring squadrons were outfitted with Spitfires, which was a much better plan. Only two of the top squadrons had hurricanes. And what makes this even more astounding is the Battle of Britain lasted 15 weeks, but the Polish squadron wasn't activated until September and only fought in the last six weeks. So it fought in less than half of the battle and still emerged as the top scoring fighter squadron in the Royal Air Force during the entire battle. Uh, there were several posters that were printed and passed around for propaganda purposes, uh, touting how well the Polish air, airmen were doing. Uh, Squadron Leader Kent wrote, after the war, we who were privileged to fly and fight with them will never forget, and Britain must never forget, how much she owes to the loyalty and dominable spirit and sacrifice of those Polish flyers. They were our staunchest allies in our darkest days. May they always be remembered as such. Squadron leader Kellett, who was kind of dubious about the Poles at first, said, we fought together through the Great Offensive of 1940, and I then knew that the pilots of number 303 squadron were not only the best, but would see me through any troubles. In the month of September 7, 303 Squadron was on top. No squadron from the Empire could equal the courage and skill of our Polish pilots. Chief Marshal Dowding, who you recall, was very skeptical of the Poles at first. After the war wrote, they were inspired by a burning hatred of the Germans, which um, made, them, made them very deadly opponents. 303, uh, first uh, squadron in group number 11 group during the course of the month shut down more Germans than any, Pol any British unit in the same period. Oops, sorry. Had it not been for the magnificent material contributed by the Polish squadrons and their unsurpassed gallantry, I have to take to say that the outcome of the battle would have been the same. Uh, Flight Leader Kent, the Canadian wrote in the Squadron Wallet, the finest squadron in the world, profound thanks for keeping me alive and teaching me to fight. The Sir Archibald Sinclair, the Secretary of State for the Air Force, wrote, our shortage of training pilots would have made it impossible to man the squadrons which were required to defeat the German Air Force, and so in the Battle of Britain if the gallant airmen of Poland had not leapt into the breach. Air Marshal Beacom wrote, what we could have done without the Polish fighter pilots in the Battle of Britain is difficult to contemplate. And a correspondent for the New York Times wrote simply, Poles are pure courage. On September 17th, Hitler postponed Operation Sea Lion, which was the invasion, planned invasion of Great Britain. And here you see the German plan for the invasion. On October 12th, he again postponed it until spring of 1941. And of course, it was never revived. That was the end of the German plan to invade Great Britain. And it failed because the Germans were not able to establish air superiority over Great Britain. Uh, here are the individual scores of pilots from the squadron. Uh, Ethel Forbes, of course, was one of the British. Uh, Ronald Kent was one of the British. Or Kellett, rather, and John Kent was Canadian. The rest were all Polish. Uh, Yusef Frontyshek was a Czech. Uh, he's interesting. He uh, fought with the Polish squadrons in France and Great Britain. And when Great Britain eventually uh, formed a Czech squadron to fight with the RAF, he was offered a chance to command it and said, no, thank you. I think I'll stay right where I am and continue to fight with the Poles. Uh, he emerged from the war as the leading uh, ace during the Battle of Britain. 
and no other squadron had 13 men as members who scored 14 German victories over German planes than the 303 squadron. If you look at the data, 303 squadrons shot down three times on average, three times as many German planes as the average Royal Air Force squadron. It suffered one third of the casualties of the average Royal Air Force squadron. The RAF average was 4.9 Germans shot down for every pilot lost. The Poles shot down 10.5 for every pilot they lost. So any way you figure this, the Poles were head and shoulders above the other squadrons. Part of this was, I think, because of the German, of uh, the Polish ground crews who kept the planes in the air. While English ground crews tended to go home at night, come back in the morning, if there were damaged aircraft to be repaired, the Poles simply worked all night. There were only four days during the entire Battle of Britain when the squadron took off with less than the full complement of 12, plane, 12 planes. Five Poles received the British Distinguished Flying Cross. You can see four of them here. Uh, the other one received it posthumously. 1941, they were re-equipped with Spitfires in January, a much better aircraft. Several of them were reassigned as instructors to other British squadrons. During the year, for the most part, they conducted raids where fighters would sweep through German-occupied territory and machine gun uh, German aircraft on the ground to prevent them from taking off. And they also flew fighter escort for bomber raids on German positions for about six weeks. And during the time that they flew escort missions, not a single bomber was shot down uh, by German fighters. During 41, they were scheduled, they were credited with 41, excuse me, 46 German planes destroyed, seven probables, and four damaged. Uh, in March, Marion Cooper, who founded the original squadron in 1919, came for a visit and was hosted by the Polish pilots. During 1942, they split their time between escorting bomber raids over German-occupied territory and fighter sweeps, mostly against German airfields. And for the latter part of the year, when American squadrons began to arrive, the United States now in the war, they were stationed at the same airfield with the 94th U.S. Air Squadron. Uh, one of the members of the 94th wrote, they sent us to train with the Polish uh, combat squadron in Britain, 303 Polish pursuit group. They were flying Spitfires. Those Polish kids taught us everything they had learned in combat over Europe. Then we went along on seven combat operations over France. On none of these were we jumped by the Jerrys. The Poles are the best sky fighters I ever saw. Meaning, in other words, on all of these flights, the Germans were never able to successfully surprise them. Another member of the group wrote, we owe more to 303 than can be expressed in words. They are the best damn fighting squadron in the world. April 1942, a number 11 group of the Royal Air Force had a gunnery contest. They had a contest to see which of the squadrons had the best aim, let's say. There were 22 squadrons in the group. Three of the squadrons were Polish. Here's how they finished. Of the 22 squadrons, the top three were Polish. The top British squadron was 150 points. The lowest Polish squadron was 183. So you can see one of the reasons why they were so successful was their tactics, their aim, 
And British pilots were taught to close to within 300 to 500 yards and begin firing, and not to close within 300, more than 300 yards because they might be hit by flying debris. Polish pilots tended to fly within 300 yards before even opening fire. So they generally fired on German planes a lot closer than most of their British colleagues. 1943, they split their time between escort duty and fighter sweeps. By this time, much of the German Air Force had been destroyed, so air opposition was only sporadic. And uh, they were in May, Northern Ireland until May of uh, recuperating and re, uh, refitting and taking a rest. And the rest of the year, they mostly flew escort for American and British bomber raids over Germany. Elliot Chess, who had originally designed the squadron logo, was serving at that time with the United States Air Force in Great Britain. So he paid a visit and was given a copy of the squadron logo, and here you're seeing him uh, signing the squadron diary. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, the Polish squadron flew fighter support over the beaches at Normandy, so it was protecting against any attempted German uh, counterattack, air counterattack, uh, over the beaches as the Allies were landing in Normandy. And finally, in 1945, it again resumed escort duties and fighter sweeps, although opposition in the air by that time was rather rare. It flew its last mission on April 25th, 1945, escorting American bombers in a raid on Hitler's home in Berchtesgaden. And here you see the squadron leader at that time removing the Kosciuszko Squadron emblem from the last active fighter plane when the squadron was finally deactivated on December 11th, 1946. Here you see uh, the results of their wartime activity. They flew over 9,900 individual flight operations against the Germans, an incredible number. They destroyed, credited with destroying at least 205 German aircraft and probably 40 more and damaging 28. Uh, here's the Polish Air Force, Force uh, symbol. And during the course of the war, there were 14 Polish squadrons that served with the RAF, including both fighter squadrons, bomber squadrons, and also reconnaissance units. This was the fourth largest air force in Europe. And not many people realize this. Next to the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, Poland had the fourth largest Allied Air Force unit fighting against the Germans in Europe during World War II. It included over 17,000 men, not only pilots, but ground crew, observers, air gunners, and so forth, serving in the United Kingdom during the war. Poles were credited with shooting down 745 German aircraft, with another 175 more as problems. They flew 102,000 sorties with over 290,000 flying hours, combat flying hours. And they were awarded 342 British decorations for gallantry during the war. It's an enormous and amazing record which is to a large extent forgotten today. There is a, a monument in Great Britain to the different Polish squadrons that fought for the Allied cause. It's located at Northolt in England, which was one of the bases that the Kosciuszko squadron eventually flew from. And you can see here it's in both English and Polish. 
Following the war, of course, you had the communist takeover in Poland. And at one point, the British Air Minister, uh, Chief Marshal, Sir William Shelto Douglas, was sent to Warsaw to take part in a commemoration of the victory in World War II. And he was specifically told not to say anything about the Royal Air Force veterans of Polish descent because it might offend the Russians. When he gets to the Warsaw and is asked to comment on the occasion, he said, I'm not a politician, I'm simply an airman and have been so all my life. I know little of politics. All I know is that fighting beside the Royal Air Force throughout the war has been a gallant band of Polish airmen, the Polish Air Force. The crucible of war has fused those two forces, the Royal Air Force and the Polish Air Force together. We have been comrades in arms and we shall remain comrades in peace. So one purpose of this exhibition, that is the exhibition they were opening in Warsaw, is to enable the Royal Air Force to offer a small tribute to the gallantry and loyalty of our comrades in the Polish Air Force. They leave behind them a record of gallantry unsurpassed in the Royal Air Force. The, the, the uh, Russians, of course, were not happy. Following the fall of communism, after the election of, uh, free election of a new Polish government, the original flags, the original colors of the Polish Air Force in Great Britain were returned to Warsaw, and here you see them uh, being presented to Polish Air Force officials and President Lech Wałęsa. So, I thank you very much for your patience and your attention.